So here's a quote um, starting off with from Helen Molesworth, who's the chief curator at um, Museum of Contemporary Art in LA. I'm interested in termite art, is what the quote says. And uh, this really speaks to me in my, my, my own work. Um, I consider myself a termite artist, and I'll explain what I think it means. Um, I think it means someone that is, maybe David touched upon this a little bit, someone that sort of is able to sustain uh, art making over the years, um, through all the ups and downs, um, and also is very single-minded and focused about what it is they want to do, but at the same time keeping an eye on what, you know, what is kind of the general framework with which you're working up against. Um, it's also someone I think that isn't necessarily a project-based artist. I mean, I hear that term quite a lot, um, and I understand um, a number of artists work that way, but I would say that's not the way I work. I work very much in a studio-based practice where you, again, the idea of the termite, you kind of burrow down and explore ideas. So that's just a kind of interesting way of framing um, the images I'm going to show. So here's my <clears throat> the building I work in, I teach in, but I also have my studio. So there's a sort of blending of teaching and working in my life. And then on the right is my house where David has been down to many times. Oh, sorry, I'll go back a minute. Here's my children, Isla Bram and Fennel. Um, and I would say don't let art making detract from having children or don't let children detract from art making. And anybody that wants to do both, it's possible to do. It's difficult, but it's possible. So starting in with the most recent work. Um, so one of the things I'm going to bring in tonight is my, my interest outside of art. Um, I, I read a lot outside of you know, art history and art theory. Um, a lot of uh, writing on landscape, a lot of writing on um, environmentalism. And um, this work was actually inspired directly by a couple of books. One by Peter Davidson called The Idea of North. Um, which is interesting because I'm right up here in Vermont right now and I grew up in northeastern Scotland. So I'm, I'm someone that's very aware of what being northern means and it's in my palette, it's in the way I think about imagery. Just as, you know, if you look at Gauguin's paintings, they were very much aware of being from the south, you know, with that kind of palette, that kind of celebration. So um, the book, The Idea of North, um, and he talks about um, ghosts as being a, ghosts as being a particularly northern phenomena. So um, these are actually drawings of blueberry nets um, over blueberry bushes um, and also other kinds of uh, uh, tarps that are thrown over bushes in people's gardens. And I started noticing these as I was just driving around, these kind of white sh forms just looming up um, out of, you know, you're just kind of driving around in, in this green mass and you just see this form looming. And I'm really taken on by this, you know, a number of different ways. One, um, just the, the beauty of it, just this kind of ghostly presence. The second thing is the resourcefulness, you know, that sort of this sort of human interaction in the landscape that, you know, there's a reason, there's a utilitarian reason to put that net over there. But also the third thing would be how I look at it through my eyes. So these drawings, the subject matter is a blueberry bush under a net, but that's not the content. That's not what the work is about. Um, and I'm going to read a quote um, as I bring in the second book that I was um, that influenced this work. It's by Marvin Carlson, who's a, actually a theatre critic, and it's from his book The Haunted Stage. And he says, one of the universals of performance performance both in the East and West is its ghostliness, its sense of return, the uncanny but in inescapable impression imposed upon its spectators that we are seeing something we've seen before. And he's talking about um, things like um, stages and also actors' bodies. So if you've seen an actor in one film um, and you see them in another film, you can't help but think of them, that whole idea of typecasting, but also the idea of the haunted stage. And even though he was talking about theatre, I think it applies just as much to landscape. Um, so when I read that quote, I just, it just, a light bulb just went off for me in terms of how I saw this work. 
So I'll just, I'm just going to shoot through a number of these. The materials for this work, uh, I'm using a material called silver point, which is a very old-fashioned um, way of drawing. It's basically just silver um, inserted into a propeller pencil. And then you kind of burnish the paper. And it was a very conscious choice of material because it's literally a very silvery, kind of diaphanous, shimmery material that was absolutely perfect to make this work. I mean, I couldn't have made this work with uh, charcoal or ink. It had to be something that was really light. Um, and the other reason I chose silver point was a conceptual reason um, that silver point changes color over time. It goes from cold gray to a kind of warm sepia. So as the material is changing, so does the imagery. So these blueberry nets are transient. They're very, you know, they're there for a period of time and then they're taken off. Um, and I, so I was trying to connect the material with the imagery. Um, in talking about drawing, um, and my, I mean, my choice is to, my choice of material, which is drawing and painting and, um, you know, making things by hand. Um, I think a lot of times people that make things by hand, especially in this particular climate that we live in, question it. You know, when you could, I mean, now you can make a video on your iPhone. You don't even need any, you don't need to rent equipment anymore. Um, but for me, technology connects us quickly to people and to places. And then the effect sort of dissipates quite quickly. Um, but painting and drawing for me, connect us solely and palpably in two different ways. One, it's the slow, it's slow because of its long history. You know, we have an, a kind of awareness of drawing and painting's history out there. And also because it's palpable, um, the physical surface and tension in the work reaches forth and connects to people. So those things are the reasons that I continue to make. Those are the two main reasons why I continue to make uh, these images, and they're very much helped along by technology, but um, the the final piece really needs to be handmade. And then the other thing I think about um, drawing is drawing and painting are they're um, recording what I don't yet fully see or understand, and only in the process of painting and repainting or drawing do I come to see it. So why was I obsessed or drawn to these forms. I mean, I would literally screech my car to a halt and drive back five miles to go and take a picture of one of these. And I think I didn't really understand that until I started drawing them. Um, here's just some more versions. So these are all uh, about 18 by 20, no, 18 by 30, 22 by 30 inches, silver point on ground on paper. And they're just a work table shot. Um, and then attached to that series is this series of very small drawings. Um, and this slide here is, I'm going to show this because it kind of encapsulates the series, um, called Ground Covering. And these are very linked to the blueberry bush drawings of um, similar odd quirky forms that I would see in passing. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the subject matter as I start to bring in the paintings. And just before I bring in the paintings, um, one kind of overriding question in my work, which I, I haven't answered and I don't think I will answer it because I think it's impossible to answer it, but the question is, do places themselves contain memory or do we bring memory to places? A memorial site, for example, does a memorial site contain memories or do we attach memories to a memorial? And I think that's a really hard question to answer. Um, there's an, a writer called Marcia Eliad who wrote a book called The Sacred and the Profane where he talks about this question. Um, and it's, it's a question that really drives, you know, drives a lot of my work decisions. Um, so I'm moving on to some paintings now. So another related series to these uh, silver point drawings are these works I've been doing under the... Uh, series title Sky on, Sky on Ground. And these are um, basically paintings of puddles, reflections in puddles that are 
uh, that start out as photographs. And um, it's very important to me that the object that's reflected isn't in the painting, it's just the reflection. So again, I'm really interested in this kind of mysterious, um, uncanny, something we're familiar with, but um, when we see it again, this Marvin Carlson idea of it being returned again to us, um, what is it doing that's new? I mean, a million people will walk past that same puddle, but they're not going to stop and look at it the way I do. And that's what's interesting to me. Um, so, in other words, the, the kind of situated and then the transcendent. That's the kind of, you know, balance. And another thing I try and do with subject matter as an artist is I try and reflect upon rather than react to subject matter. So when I see something, I'm definitely startled. It's definitely a reaction. But then I make a lot of work exploring that as a way to reflect on it. And that's also evident in the subject matter that I choose. So it's kind of a dual thing. There are literal reflections in the work or transparencies. But um, also, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually also reflecting upon those. So these are... Um, casein and oil on canvas um, 25 by 34 inches and they're all <laughs> called sky on ground number one, sky on ground number two, sky on ground number three, it's a detail and they're all taken um, just locally where I live. This is just a video that I shot. So that surprising moment at the end where, I mean, it seems like a very boring video and then you get that change of light. I didn't expect that at all. That's another, that's just one of those moments that just, you know, I just find enthralling. Um, I'll just shoot through some more of these. These are actually larger paintings. Uh, sorry, this one here is um, six by seven feet. So I tried them on a larger scale also. Um, so then these, these pieces here, or this piece here, um, this is a car, with, um, an upside down car in a puddle. Um, so I kind of moved from natural imagery like branches and things into more, um, uh, you know, man-made. And this is actually in a car park, a grocery store car park. So it's just a completely mundane scene of a car reflected in a puddle on a rainy day in a car park. But for me, this painting, again, that's just the subject matter. It's not the content. So the photographer, Jem Southam, um, has taken a lot of different photographs of ponds. And what he, how he talks about his ponds are full. They're like a mirrored disc or an eye reflecting the heavens. For me, there are sumps that will pull or suck us down into the earth. And similarly, um, Leo Marx, in his book, The Machine in the Garden, talks about singling out water for its magical properties, at times transparent, at others a mirror. Water bemuses us with the possibilities of penetrating the surface of nature, yet it flattens and disturbs us by casting back our own image. So there's a lot of stuff out there, I think, that kind of pertains to what I'm doing or what I try to do in the work. And then uh, just some black drawings on black paper just to... Um, you know, I think when you're working in your studio, you're, you're doing something, you're working on white ground. It's good just to take a turn sometimes and just do something different. So work on black ground, you know, just to try something different. So similar imagery, but just with black ground. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the inescapable uh, painting history behind some of this work. Caspar David Friedrich's The Great Reserve from 1832. So obviously there's a history of reflections in painting um, that frame, that also frame this work. Um, Jacob van Rysdale, these are shot directly in a museum, hence the bad, um, the bad shots. But what I'm interested in in my work is zeroing in on little sections, more like this. So this is a detail from this painting. So I'm not interested in um, 
painting landscapes like this. I'm not interested in sublime landscapes. I'm not interested in panoramas. I'm not interested in the idea of the eye, my eye kind of zooming over a landscape. I'm interested in looking kind of down into a small area and examining that. This is a, a little um, detail of a Pizarro painting. And a still from a really great film called This Side of Paradise by Ernie Gerr from 1991. I couldn't get the film to show it, but it's, um, it's all shot in a flea market in Poland. And the whole film is shot in puddles on the ground. All these people are reflected in water on the ground. And then these are some working images that I take. You know, we're all photographers now. We all have cameras in our pocket. And I like like that just as much as the next person. And it's actually been a great tool as an artist to have instant access because before you'd have to run back to your studio, get your camera, bring it back. And now you can just, you know, whip it out from your pocket and take a picture. And, you know, quite good quality pictures too. So these are just the, the working photographs that I start with and then manipulate to make the paintings. And then um, a series that preceded the puddle paintings is a series called Around um, and then kind of morphing into Uncanny Valley. And this was a kind of knee-jerk reaction to moving to New England. Um, although I moved to New England 10 years ago and this work is only from about two years ago, but um, New England's a strange place to move to <laughs> because it has its own set of culture, its own set of qualities and it's got a lot of greenery that you have to contend with uh, and I just found driving around in this green I just found it claustrophobic and I, I so what I did was I started to look for other things and I started to see these man-made little interruptions like these little hay bales and as I was driving around I thought they just look kind of funny and quirky like these look like a set of false teeth and this was like candy canes and you know, it, they're just strange, but they're also utilitarian. You know, they've got this purpose. So um, that's what that series was. And there's some it's a working photograph there. And then some other images. Um, this is an odd picture of uh, trees inside bags, which, you know, obviously they're used to irrigate the young tree. But just the idea of the plastic bag in the field with this tree growing out of it was just fascinating to me. And then some of these strange fence posts that you see around. <coughs> and then just a studio shot of that work in progress. Um, some more, these um, posts were in that previous painting. And then these. Um, ribbons that people put out in their fields to cordon off things. And this is kind of wacky. So a lot of these images don't make it into paintings. Some of them do, some of them don't, but they're just things that I see as I'm out and about. This stopped me in my tracks one day, uh, this wrapped mailbox, wrapped in plastic. It was like a crystal mailbox. <laughs> And then these little yellow forms by the ocean. This is a um, garden tarps or winterizing plants, but you know, for all intents and purposes, to me they look like body bags. It's a really eerie, really eerie image. And then some earlier work. Um, this series is called Landscape Edges, where I, it's they're collages where I basically cut out every part of the landscape where it touched another part, so trees against sky, water against sand, whatever it was, um, forming these edges. And then I made, you know, basically recreated these new landscapes out of that. And then a series of drawings um, called Isles Counties. This is from about 10, 12 years ago. And um, these were rearranged maps. I was in grad school around about the time when the whole idea of mapping and place was really starting to burgeon and even the, the idea of place as a place studies um, was kind of new and up and coming. So I was 
in grad school right around that time. And as somebody that had moved to the States from another country, you know, you're always aware of another place. It's kind of in the back of your mind. So one of the ways I sort of dealt with that was to take, it was very literal, was to take the map and just rearrange it. So these are 166 islands that are actually like strings of archipelagos, but I just reorganized them in this drawing. It's just graphite on paper. And then I did the same with, um, these are all the Scottish lochs. So every single one that's um, painstakingly copied out of a map and then done in watercolour on paper. This was done pre-digital, so I didn't use Photoshop layers or anything. And then some other projects I've done. This is a piece I did in uh, Brooklyn, New York at Grid Space. Um, <coughs> it's a storefront, <coughs> excuse me, storefront gallery. And um, I did a piece with... Um, I guess I do have an envelope piece, David, with the inside of security envelopes that have all these patterns on them, and I cut them into these tiny strips, collaged them on paper, and brought them down to um, the gallery and just inserted them into the window. Um, this piece is called Waving Frontal System. And then the great thing about this piece was I didn't even consider the fact that you could see the back of the drawing. So this is inside the gallery looking out where the piece was you know, so basically you can see the inside and the outside. So I love that idea. And then I did a piece at Window in um, Asheville, North Carolina, um, based on the weather. I do have a detail of this. So I saved the weather report in Scotland for about six-month period, and then I rearranged it into this poem. And basically everything in the poem is, you know, depressing sounding. So it's, you know, risk of a shower, squally showers, you know, and some weather reports would just say the word rain about 50 times. And, but then there was other more metaphorical language like another deep low in the depression in the Atlantic today. And I thought, you know, there I was in northeast Scotland and I had this life in the United States and the Atlantic was separating us and this idea of the depression in the Atlantic. You know, it was just kind of interesting how the, the language that was used in the weather report kind of pertained to human feelings. Anyway, so what I did was I just did this, um, I made this image on Photoshop and then it was blown up onto vinyl and it was placed inside the window of this storefront. And I think it's really good for artists to do projects like this now and again that are extensions of what I was talking about the er in the earlier part of the talk. You know, I always come back to the drawing and the painting but kind of moving out of that into other areas. Um, also along the same lines of the um, envelopes, I actually have made some pieces that have, I think I kind of classify them as falling off the wall because um, I am very much a 2D thinker, but this was a piece called Waves Shore, also made from the recycle envelopes on the on cardboard on, on the floor. And so the idea of this wave just kind of emanating and coming in at you is a detail. This piece took a long time to make. Um, so now I'm going to kind of transport you into the middle of the desert for five or ten minutes. So five years ago I took off and went to Roswell, the Roswell Artists in Residency Program in southeastern New Mexico. And I arrived there um, and it was pretty daunting to say the least. That's my house. That's the view outside my window. And I was and this isn't the sexy part of New Mexico. This isn't Santa Fe or Albuquerque. This is like West Texas. This is like, look outside your window and it's nothing except some tumbleweeds. And there's no people. I mean, there were the other five residents, but you know, you're on your own out there in the desert and there's scorpions in your house and there's centipedes this big. Can you see? Can you see? And there's these things called vinegaroons that eat scorpions and it's just weird. <laughs> so I arrived there and I was just kind of at a loss. So I started photographing the um, horizon line outside my studio because I just needed something to literally anchor myself. I needed something to hold on to. So then I started making these paintings. Um, so you can see how much being out there impacted not just you know obvious things like imagery but palette and space. Because anyone that's been in New Mexico, has anyone 
been out there. I know you have, David. It's got a unique sense of space, like nowhere else I've been. It's just, you feel like space is infinite. It just doesn't end. And it's kind of the opposite of New England, where it's like living in Tupperware box. You know, it's like everything's pressing down on you, the big trees. But out there, it's just like, oh, you're all, you know, everything's just strung out. And there's a huge big sky. And anyway, so I was very, very, very um, aware of that and very moved by that. Um, there's the photograph that I took, and it looks like a film strip. It's just a 360-degree view of my um, location in the middle of the desert. And then I used that to make a painting. It's very, very literal work in how it's put together. And I think after the work is made, and then I then try and invest you know, a lot of the ideas and the thinking. I then try and kind of digest what the work means. So this was a very long painting, that's at the top, it's like four, 432 inches altogether as a detail. And then I made some drawings, similar drawings um, of the, the landscape just as you're kind of moving around it. And it was a way for me to place or emplace myself into this space that had no personal meaning or, or history whatsoever. Um, you know, and Roswell is actually, as you know, the the home of aliens, the alien landing. You guys know that whole story, the UFOs. But, you know, I kind of felt like an alien out there. These are just some detailed shots. And then um, at the end of the residency, the residents had um, uh, an exhibition at the museum, uh, one-person exhibition. So when you go into the residency, you you know, you're, know that that's kind of coming up. Um, and then this is another, uh, this piece in the front is another example of the floor pieces that I've done from time to time that um, kind of complement the works on paper and the, the paintings that I do, or they kind of grow out of them. There's a detail here. Um, and that's actually the last slide. And I just wanted to finish up by, you know, just kind of arcing a little bit back to the beginning again. And this this work that I'm showing here is just a kind of slice of 20 years of work. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I have tried to do as an artist is just be very persistent over the years. I was actually talking about this dinner with uh, Dave and Mark and how, you know, when you're applying to things, when you leave school and you're applying to things, residencies and so forth, um, rejections are going to come your way and, you know, they're kind of, um, arbitrary, you know, it really doesn't have much relationship to your work. I mean, there's it's kind of a numbers game, and I think you just have to keep being persistent and um, seeing the course of your life as an artist as a large, you know, long period of time and not something that's immediate. And I think another thing that's really important is to go back to the Helen Molesworth quote is just doing something that you're really interested in but not being ignorant of what is going on. Um, and I think that's made it possible for me to, I've never lived in a major art center in my life. I lived in Glasgow, I didn't live in London. I lived in Chicago, not New York. Now I live in a town of 10,000 people, but it's close to Boston and close to New York. So it's, I feel like it's incumbent upon me to go and see what's going on. And, but at the same time, you know, I decided I wanted to also have a family. So in order to cultivate that, it wasn't possible to live in Manhattan. <laughs> so, you know, I think you have to kind of always be balancing, engaging and juggling and figuring out how to put it all together and just be really determined and focused in your work. Get to the studio. I mean, I've got to the studio with, you know, one kid in a stroller and one kid on a baby Bjorn and paying for the babysitter for the other kid or but I still go to the studio and just be totally determined and believe in what you're doing because that translates to other people um, and David is also right in terms of um, always being nice to people in the art world also because it, it is a very small place and um, you do meet people over and over again and it's very important not to make enemies so 
on that note, I think I will wrap up. <laughs> Thank you.